If you've ever stopped and thought about it, there's a lot of common sayings about blood. That you put your blood, sweat, and tears into something. That you and someone else have bad blood. And in scary movies, it's always about blood. Blood is often associated with bad or loss, and for good reason, because whenever we see blood, it's not in our bodies. You know, where it's supposed to be. Blood is vital to the essence of life. It is synonymous with your well-being due to it being the transport of everything you need and don't need in your body. And people have known this for a while, though people haven't always done the best job of treating it. Did you know that hundreds of years ago, doctors used to perform a treatment called bloodletting? Basically, when you were sick, they would intentionally remove bad blood, thinking that would help. We've come a long way since then. But I'm getting sidetracked. The point is, the health of your blood is important. It is the highway for all life-preserving ingredients to get them to where they need to go. And as you might have guessed, there's a nutrient whose main mission is the quality of your blood. So without further ado, let's talk about the true nutrients. Copper is an essential nutrient, one that the body cannot make on its own, thus it must be consumed via food or supplementation. Copper has been used for thousands of years in everything from construction to electricity to tools, but its nutritional essentiality was not recognized until the 1920s. Copper is what's considered a trace mineral, meaning that it's needed in the body in far lower concentrations than certain other minerals like sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. In total, there's only about 50 to 120 milligrams of copper in the average body at any given point. About two-thirds of it is found in bone and muscle, and a lot of it is located in the liver and brain as well. Now, copper is consistently being excreted from the body, usually in the form of urine and bile, so its regular consumption is important, but active consumption of it is not as crucial as certain other nutrients because it's fairly dense in quite a lot of common foods, and it's a generally bioavailable micronutrient. It's typically absorbed between a 30-40% to 40 rate, but it has been shown to be as low as 10% or as high as 70%, depending on the person, the food, and a few other variables. Because of this, copper is far from the most commonly deficient mineral in the world, thus they didn't feel the need to include it on a standard nutrition label unless copper has been added to the product after the fact. Copper is one of those minerals that everyone who's dipped their toe into nutrition is aware of, yet I think most of those people would be hard-pressed to tell you what it actually contributes, so let's remedy that, shall we? For how little copper there actually is in the body, it has quite a few functions and benefits. Without a doubt, the most well-known and realistically most essential is copper's role in blood. Copper contributes significantly to the creation and function of red blood cells. For one thing, adequate copper in the body enables proper absorption of iron in the intestine, and together they form red blood cells and hemoglobin, contributing to how your body handles oxygen and creates energy. Thus, copper is arguably as important as iron itself in combating iron deficiency anemia. If you want more information on that, I have a whole video just like this entirely dedicated to iron. But that's not all. Copper also plays a role in bone synthesis, regulating calcium and phosphorus deposits needed for the proper function of osteoblasts, the specialized cells that make bone. And also in the building realm, copper is used to develop and maintain other key bodily structures, including collagen, which is in skin and connective tissue, keratin, which is used in your hair and nails, melanin, and brain cells during its development. And speaking of the brain, copper is also a cofactor for enzymes that ensure signals are efficiently sent to and from the brain. A deficiency can delay these signals, causing a crucial lack of coordination, control, and reaction time. And beyond all this, proper intake of copper is shown to contribute to many other benefits as well. It regulates heart health, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels, maintains health and function of nerve cells, activates several immune responses, helps to steer clear of prostate inflammation and cancer, and acts as an antioxidant, combating free radicals and preventing DNA damage. Yes, copper is indeed a jack-of-all-trades. Now, copper is unique in the sense that it has one of the lowest daily consumption requirements of all micronutrients. The recommended daily intake for both men and women is 900 micrograms, or 0.9 milligrams. That number does rise up to 1,000 micrograms when pregnant and 1,300 micrograms when breastfeeding. But like I said earlier, copper is a fairly accessible nutrient, and the average daily intake for it falls between 1,100 and 1,400 micrograms for adults, which is safely above the recommendations. 
Add on top of that the fact that it's pretty bioavailable, again, usually at a 30 to 40% absorption rate, and you get a micro that is not a very common deficiency. Copper deficiency is very rare in the general population, usually occurring alongside an underlying disease like cystic fibrosis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, or Manx syndrome, or an oversupplementation of zinc. There's also those who just poorly absorb the nutrient. Copper deficiency can be difficult to diagnose without an official blood test because its symptoms are similar to those of other microdeficiencies. Those symptoms include fatigue, common chills, inflammation in the skin, frequent sickness, brittle bones, easy bruising, poor hair health, abnormally poor coordination, and of course, anemia. Now on the other end, the upper limit for copper is 10,000 micrograms or 10 milligrams, a very high amount that is difficult to exceed, yet copper toxicity is definitely a thing. It's usually from over-intake of copper supplements or over-consumption of very copper-rich foods like beef liver, and it's been associated with a few issues related to the heart, kidney, and liver. Copper toxicity is also much more likely in those with Wilson's disease. If you have any concerns regarding any of this, I'd recommend getting your copper levels tested with a blood or urine test before making any dramatic dietary changes. And as per usual, the last thing I want to go over is the best sources of copper. Copper is found in moderate amounts in a wide variety of foods, so I'm only going to be showing off the most dense. In terms of animal foods, beef liver practically breaks the charts, which makes some sense because there's a good amount of copper in our livers as well. Beyond that, the next best options are seafood like oysters, squid, lobster, crab, and of course, cuttlefish. A single serving of any of those will pretty much get you all the copper you need for that day. Beyond that, there are a few other meat and seafood options that are pretty solid, but also pretty much every other meat not on this list will contain some. As for plant foods, the best sources per gram are, as usual, nuts and seeds and dark chocolate, though oats, beans, soy, and greens also have a fair amount to offer. For the majority of people who eat both meat and plant foods, copper is rarely a concerning nutrient. And copper supplements are available, but are really only needed in fringe cases. And so, another nutrient covered. I don't know about y'all, but to me it's always interesting to think of these minerals and really recognize that it's practically the same thing as the metals we use in our day-to-day -day life. The very same copper that's used to make wires or bronze metals is the exact same copper that's used to make our blood, admittedly in much smaller concentrations. And I am so glad that's how it works because I really like how my blood does what it does and I especially like it when it stays inside my body. Now, if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe as I have plenty more of these on the way. Go ahead and let me know down in the comments what other nutrients you think deserve an entire in-depth breakdown video like this. And remember that all I ask is that you do your own research and advocate for your body. You only get the one.